<laughs> we've, we've all been there, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, the, the tests have failed. Just give it, just give it another go. Yeah. Welcome to another episode of Offscript. Today we're talking about static site generators. So we're just uh, we're just tucking into um, some jerky that you brought back from America. Yep. Um, which is fantastic. The Americans know how to do jerky. They do, except the other two bags, which are not as good because they're mouldy. <laughs> So I opened them a little while ago, and uh, I maybe forgot to seal the bags properly. I, I just thought it was invincible. I don't know why. Is my level okay? Your level's great. Okay, good. Yeah. I think you're okay. Yeah. Fantastic. You happy with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, so we're just tucking into that, which will, will give good acoustic sound effects. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good mouth noises. Good mouth noises during this episode. But um, So today we're going to talk about um, static site generators and... We've kind of touched on these uh, a little bit in the past. Uh, we've talked a lot about Netify and hosts that really play into this ecosystem. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to kind of use this episode to talk about was the differences between static site generators and what are essentially full stack frameworks. Um, you know, there's I saw an amazing talk um, uh, a while ago, I think back in November in uh, FFConf uh, yeah. in, in Brighton. And uh, it was by Sophie Kunin who talked about the joy of creating the personal website. Um, and she touched on loads of different things. And it was a really great talk. I think it's online now. You should definitely watch it if you can. Awesome. Um, but one of the things that she kind of leaned into quite heavily was static side generators and some of the kind of technologies that you can use. Um, she was mostly focusing on the fun side of it, which is the creative fun side of the personal website. But there's loads of stuff that she talked about as well, which leaned into SSGs. Awesome. Um, so I thought it'd be fun just to talk about them a little bit. Um, and uh, that's my idea of fun these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, talk about them a little bit, talk about their kind of history uh, as far as I know about them. And also just talk about the differences between that and full stack frameworks. Because you've been using stack site generators for a while, like in the Ruby days, there was loads of stuff, wasn't yeah. there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I love them. I love the simplicity of them. Um I think one of the key things that, um, so I'm, I'm really loving Astro at the moment. I'm using Astro to build um, lots of kind of mini sites. I've rebuilt a stack site in it too. Nice. Um, it's great. And, and and Astro talks a lot about content sites versus web apps, essentially. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to think about, like the context of what you're building. Um, are you building something that is a content-driven site, not necessarily via CMS? Um or are you building something with more interactivity and application logic in it? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good starting point when you're deciding what sort of tools to use. Um, but they, they've kind of come a long way. Um, and the ecosystem that supports static site generations come a long way as well. So back in the days of uh, Jekyll, which you called out when we were talking about this earlier, um, Jekyll was one of the first ones that I'd, I'd um, yeah. used. Um, and it kind of changed the game a little bit in terms of how people wrote content driven websites um i really loved how everything was kind of from markdown um i think it was one of the first tools to use front matter yaml front matter in markdown yeah that rings a bell yep um so that that was cool so it's a bit of a journey really because every website was static to begin with yeah when the web launched so yeah. one file would be one page yeah and then a bunch of companies including steve jobs when he was at next mm. was talking about imagine a request comes in and the page is made <laughs> on the fly just for that person. Yeah. Like, can you imagine it? Mm. And then everyone was like, all right, well, that's how we do the internet now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so every request is a new process and it just generates HTML. Mm. Yeah, for that person. And that's that That was the web application boom. Yeah. And then we kind of forgot about files <laughs> yeah. um, until single page web applications. Yeah. And lots of hacks to make things faster, like... Um, turbo links and things like that mm. to make it feel more like a yeah a thing and then yeah a whole bunch of new devs coming and going oh you can just make a page now <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't know whether to laugh or cry when you started seeing the term uh, MPA yeah. Yeah. it's like oh are you building an SPA on an MPA a multi-page application it's like mm. well that is the, the foundations of the internet yeah we're going back <laughs> to the start yeah. One page, 
per page. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they were called pages. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, obviously not mocking, you know, people who have not, not heard about some of these kind of more primitive roots of the internet, but I, I do think it's interesting how we've gone full circle. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's a, it's a really exciting time. We, we've never had a, a better, um, ecosystem of options to choose from, uh, based on what you're, what you're trying to build. Um, and I, I'm really excited for, for kind of a lot more of these tools to evolve. Um, you know, I'm really loving where Astro is going. I think Astro is taking a lot of the best kind of features and functionality from full stack frameworks and making them really accessible. Yeah. Um, and more importantly, really fast. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the, um, looking at some of the stats from, uh, Astro. So, you know, they're saying it's 50% faster, um, 50% faster in terms of website load speed increases sales by 12%. 20% faster means 10% more conversions. 40% faster has been proven to lead that more than 15% more signups on apps. Nice. So speed is really very much at the forefront of a lot of these static generated sites. Um, because obviously, as you mentioned, you're only rendering it directly off the server. You're not doing really anything um, heavy lifting in terms of that. It's just serving the static content straight up. Yeah. Uh, which is way faster, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And it's, yeah, it it just reduces the risk of anything going wrong as well. Like it's good, yeah. even for big web apps that have a lot of dynamic stuff. If you have a whole set of static files there yeah. to fall back to, mm. that was that's just going to increase your nines all the way across, isn't it? Five nines territory. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the things that, um, so one of the things, one of the ways this is achieved is that you're kind of front loading a lot of the initial compilation and, and kind of building of the site. So usually what happens is you'll, you'll build uh, locally. There'll be some nice development mode on the framework that you were using. Um, and it will go through a compilation phase, which will then spit out a bunch of uh, flat HTML files that you can chuck onto a server. Um, That's it. So the, yeah, a lot of that kind of is brought forward really in terms of, um, in terms of where the the energy is spent, it's during the compilation phase instead of the um, at request time, which, yeah. is, which is cool. Um, what is cool is you, you're seeing a really nice plugin uh, architecture ecosystem come out of this sort of stuff, where you're throw be able to easily throw in um, different style systems like Tailwind or different content formats like Markdown or something like that. Um, and you're really getting a lot more freedom, I feel, with a lot of these frameworks to build things how it works for you. Yeah. Um, whereas I think a lot of, and obviously full stack frameworks have also come come the same way, right? You know, you, everything's a lot more a la carte. You can pick and choose what you want. Yeah. And that sort of one arm bandit approach can be good and bad, but yeah. it's definitely getting a lot better. Um, yeah. Um, for websites where there's, millions of pages would static site generator still be a good thing um i guess it depends how you're authoring the content right so a cms is obviously where you commonly pop something like this into um there's lots of different questions around when it would be the right time to split from something like this um i guess it depends how many people are uh, editing the content um how technical the team are um whether editing raw markdown files and yaml front matter is appropriate for what you're trying to build yeah um, i think if you had an awful, an awfully large set of content kind of directories. I imagine that would be quite cumbersome to to manage after a long time. Yeah, um, because essentially you're just using your editors to try and find the right files. Yeah, maybe you'd have to develop a system to find and work with those files. Mm. And I guess I, I know there's a German um, newspaper who they were using a CMS that had static files as the file storage mechanism for the post. Yeah. And they swap that out with like some Oracle or with oh. the database connector. Mm. But it feels like they're sort of like trying to drag it, kicking and streaming the <laughs> wrong direction, maybe. And that's probably where you're, mm. you're rubbing it up the wrong way a little bit. I guess it depends, right? So the, the static site generation stuff for me with Astro worked really well from a content creation point of view. Yep. But ultimately, what I'm really looking for there are the benefits of a fast, speedy, statically compiled site. So actually, I'm 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 enjoying the wins of the static generation because I also like uh, authoring my content in Markdown. Yeah, it's kind of like it just happens to be that they're combined in a, in a nice framework called Astro. Yeah. Um. But in the example that you gave of like a publishing site, one of the clients I used to work with, we we had to push 
to a static CDN because of the sheer volume of content that they were trying to push out yeah. um, and the sheer traffic that it was being sent to that site. So static made more sense there because there was less to worry about in terms of servers falling over and things like that. Yeah, makes sense. And it, there's, I guess there's other strategies as well, like um, a large kitchen manufacturer, they won't mention the name of, push all their pages into Redis and they get served directly out of there. So there's like a nightly um, task that goes and grabs the dynamic right. pages and makes them... Wow, static in Redis. That's the that's the interesting caching approach, isn't it? It is. If Redis grows pop, you're not gonna have a good time, are you? No, I mean luckily Redis is rock solid. Um but yeah, that's an interesting caching. But again, you know, by introducing that sort of caching that runs on a nightly schedule, you're introducing a lot more complexity to that. Um yeah. I imagine there'll be some really issues with stale content where you can't date it quick enough and Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could knock that one page out the cache if you had to, but yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. You, you start then, um, if you, if it's just a layer, a caching layer over the top of the framework you're doing, rather than part of the framework itself, Yeah, that's when developers get confused because they'll write a, I don't know, yeah. a contrived example, but today's news or like a date time list or like a thing saying somebody posted this 50 minutes ago. Yeah. And a naive dev would just go, oh, I could just, I could just obviously turn this date object into a, relative time stamp string and it'll be fine but then the caching layer just caches it forever yeah and then <laughs> something doesn't work yeah and um, whereas if it's part of the framework it would know actually that needs to be a server side thing yeah and you could pass server side props into a page and it knows to then get it over an api and all the rest of it so and this is where you start to get into those nice little sprinkles of functionality you start to look at like web components and things like that um, yeah. This kind of reminds me of the dark ages when you used to have script tags with run at server yeah. and it was like VB script. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you could run JavaScript locally. I'm and a cold fusion. Oh, um, God. Yeah. 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 But, you know, we, we, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of amazing lessons learned from those sorts of approaches. Um, this isn't a love letter to Astro, but I'm going to use it a lot in the example we talk about today because I'm, I'm a big fan of it. But, Astro has something called islands architecture, which allows you to just basically create little islands of um, pockets of functionality on a page, which are completely isolated from its surrounding islands. Um, but you can kind of throw state around a little bit and make them kind of aware of each other. But what's really cool is um, in, with that approach, you can have one island that's using React, you can have one island that's using Vue, you can have, and it's all quite cleverly rendered in, a, in the most efficient way to ensure the, the least amount of um, code is sent to the browser um, cool. which is cool um, yeah. but yeah and yeah the the less bits you can push over the wire the better not yeah. just for performance they've got all the environmental side as well i guess um yeah but it's yeah louis agrees louis agrees with that yeah um, <laughs> he, he, he feels very strongly about the climate emergency we find ourselves in <laughs> um but yeah it's some frameworks so just by adding them just by using them they'll send hundreds of kilobytes over the wire out the box yeah and it's very difficult to pair it back but astro is good in that regard is it yeah it's it's really quite lean in terms of how it, it knows what to send to the browser um there's kind of eager loading and stuff that comes into play um there's just loads of really nice features to it and and i guess this is kind of the the foundation of this conversation really which is you know full stack frameworks are fantastic but a lot of them come with quite a lot of weight around them in general um one of the things that um, I, I've always loved Rails for is that, you know, if you need to uh, enrich an application with more functionality, Rails already always had nice ways built into it to achieve those goals. Uh, I know it's the same with Laravel as well. Um, but the, the, the kind of challenge with things like Astro or Next.js or, um, you know, any of the other frameworks that we're talking about around the SSG side of things is that you have to kind of bring your own functionality when it gets to that point. So if you're looking for user authentication or you're looking to talk to a database or you're looking to introduce other kind of functionality that requires richer application logic, you have to kind of build that all, maybe not from scratch, but you need to kind of add that slowly to the framework yourself. Yeah. Whereas in like Rails or Laravel, you just turn a feature on maybe or you just connect to a database or, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's... It, yeah, it's all moving in a way that's positive, but it's this blurred line between front end and back end, which is worrying. Yeah. Because, and we talked about this earlier, but like 
you don't know if you're going to accidentally put some database creds into your front end. Mm. And yet you mentioned Astro gets around some of that by prefixing environment variables, which Next.js does as well. Yeah, so you'd have like public underscore. Public underscore. Yeah. So it's it's clear that that's a public one. Um, but still, if you've got this sort of mix of front end and back end in the same file, yeah, you can accidentally pass an object which contains part of an environment variable into something and it yeah. it's rendered into the page. And yeah. It's a bit too close for comfort sometimes. I, didn't. I think that that's one of the things like, you know, at least if you're dealing with something like that in a controller or somewhere you know is getting explicitly ran on the server, it's, yeah. it's a lot easier to understand, I think, with, you know, because um, Astro recently added hybrid rendering so you can render stuff both statically at compile time but also have it maybe run on a cloud function or like a Netlify function or something like that. Yeah. But a lot of this is done actually implicitly, either by the framework or by plugins, so like a Netlify plugin. So it's really hard sometimes if you're kind of running through loads of files to understand which of those functions are going to get hybrid rendered uh, and maybe run on a server-side function or actually rendered in the browser. So you're actually publishing that code to the browser. Um, as you said, there's loads of security concerns there. Yeah, definitely. And it, for developers just learning, switching their mental model between what's rendered between server and client it's yeah. going to be pretty difficult if yeah. it's in the same file as well um, yeah Definitely. but yeah i think we're only going to make a load of mistakes and then fix them i think yeah i think so <laughs> it's kind of interesting though because I, I do think it's a, it's a really important thing to push you know push the ecosystem learn from things that have been previously done in in larger frameworks and stuff like you know there's i think netify has got this really good service now where you can access uh it's almost like a a proxy that deals with a lot of the hard problems around authentication and and, and leaky um, security concerns. So, like, it allow you to talk to third party APIs without necessarily having to worry about exposing those sort of credentials in the browser and things. Yeah, um, which is great. But you know, we've we've kind of already solved some of these problems when you look at some of the kind of richer frameworks where you could just make a call to an API in a controller or yeah, you know, things like that. Yeah, well, we fixed some of that in projects previously by having like a canary environment variable, which if yeah. the WAF layer sees it, it blocks a request and things like that. Oh, so that's good, yeah. If you accidentally develop a user dump statement or something in somewhere, then, yeah. uh, then you, you're safe. And I'm, I imagine frameworks will start to add some protections against these. Or, um, but yeah. yeah, a lot of it's going to be tricky to catch. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess back to kind of talking about static site generators in terms of the way that I mostly like to use them, which is for content-driven sites. Um, I, I don't think I would design a really rich application in something like Astro. I'd maybe use something like Next, but even then, um, you know, maybe Next is a front end to, uh, you know, a, a kind of more API-backed application or something. But one of the reasons that I like uh things like Astro is it's a CMS without the CMS. Um, it's a developer friendly approach to uh, pushing out content. Yeah. Um, there's some really nice support for customization as well. So like when the markdown renders, you can really heavily influence how it renders each element and things like that. Um, a lot of them use remark under the hood of it if you use that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think for me, it's more around if you're building content driven sites, one of the things that's great is you have a more flexible data structures in those sites. So, if you want to easily add like an attribute that you want to use inside of a template or, um, you know, you can easily just add these as really loose, loose schema objects. You know, you don't have to do database migrations. You don't have to do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I guess with the looseness is, is good and bad, isn't it? So you could break a page by changing your schema, but it's not strictly enforced. So maybe it would. Yeah. Yeah, stick question marks everywhere and it's just an empty <laughs> string. But <laughs> Yeah, I think that, that is one of the challenges. And obviously, if you've got some good testing around your application, you can catch some of those things. But actually, the better way to do that sort of um, error handling, I guess, is that you can enforce the uh, the schema of the content that you're working with through something like TypeScript. You, you, know, you can define TypeScript interfaces to, to declare uh, what sort of content um, models that you're dealing with. Um, so there are ways around it. Um, and I, I do again love letter to Astro. I really like that about Astro. You can uh, you can define your content um, schema really clearly. You can say what's optional and what's required. Um, you know, YAML front matter is just a bunch of strings, really. So you can. You can you I'm really enjoying Prisma um, at the moment and TRPC, which if you use TypeScript throughout, yeah, you change your schema and it 
tells you instantly where else in your code base you need to change that because it knows yeah you can see it all in the types like it's just through static analysis so you don't even have to run the app and it tells you what the problem is so. that's really powerful isn't it yeah because th that's the other thing you know a lot Often, if you've got migrations for databases that are out of date, or you know, your something's mismatching, you don't usually find out at runtime that there's a there's a mismatch between you know database columns and what you're trying to use it with the application. I like the fact that you can statically analyze the entire code base, yeah, um, and realize when something's not not quite plumbing together right. Or yeah, I, I guess a good advantage with static site generators, going back to that for a moment, is that the you're going to find out in the build process if any of your pages are broken yeah, because it has to run them all. So yeah. you're not waiting for random execution to come in from a user to hit a page exactly. for it to error. It has to happen at build time. Yeah. I mean, it does it does shift some of the concern in some ways, but not in others. So in, in kind of more, more full stack frameworks, you may have some nice uh, monitoring libraries, error tracking libraries. Um, I know we still do a lot of client side error tracking and stuff, but maybe you're missing some of those errors that you would have caught otherwise. Uh, but as you said, it front loads a lot of the um, a lot of the real heavy lifting and, and areas where you experience those errors to the compilation phase. Um, yep. So kind of talking about deployment a little bit, I guess. Um, deployment to me seems a lot simpler with static site generation. Um, yeah. You know, you go through a compilation phase of compiling the markdown, compiling, um, you know, tailwind style sheets and things like that, for example. But on a richer application, you know, you deploy the application code, you'd restart the servers maybe, uh, or you'd restart the processes. Um, you'd maybe do database migrations. Yeah. Um, so I think there are a lot. There's a lot more to consider with full stack framework deployments as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if you're just shipping stack files, the surface area is so much smaller. Like you, yeah. you're not shipping all your content and the hidden fields and yeah, exactly. some database stuff. And yeah, it's just it's, because it's simpler. It's it's more robust. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah. know, old. Keep it simple. Keep yeah. it stupid simple. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's and that's the thing, you know, you're not you're not having to worry about cache invalidation or whatever. Like it's it's just whatever's on the server is what's being rendered. And that's much easier to debug a lot of the time. Um but then I guess when you start to look at server side and client side components that interact with user authentication and things like mm -hmm. the, that decoupling makes it harder to debug end to end where errors might be occurring within a distributed system. Yeah, definitely. Um and yeah, complex systems that require like blue green deploys where you've got the deployment about to go live and then you basically have a load balance to switch between the two. Yeah. That can be tricky sometimes if if there's database migrations involved and things like that. Yeah. Whereas with static site, you can go, This is the whole new site, and switch it over pretty easily. Yeah. Um and then yeah, and then worry about Let's say there's a login or something that yeah. can be a separate service that's deployed. And I know we don't like microservices too much, but <laughs> there is things that make sense. Yeah, for sure. Like auth would be a good yeah. service to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're looking at me like you're waiting for me to no, I just, <laughs> I just I just know that we deep down there's a, there's a sort of a <laughs> hatred there, but the, there are lines that you can draw through an app that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think I think we we've we've talked about some of the horrors of microservices. There, are, there is definitely a time and place for that sort of architecture, and you've got to understand the trade offs of distributing a system in that way. But yeah. um, I, I guess one thing to touch on uh, really about the differences between multi page apps, single page apps, you know, S, SSG sort of sites is the approach to routing. Um, you know, if you look at um, the approach to routing in all of these. Um, Static frameworks, obviously, you, you don't have a huge amount of flexibility with routing. Um, you would usually delegate the functionality if you have more dynamic routing to, you know, like an edge CDN or, or maybe the server that you're rendering the static site on. Um, you, you tend to have a lot less flexibility with routing in terms of dealing with dynamic things. Yeah. Um, whereas, obviously, with a more full stack framework, you have access to things like session state and you might be able to do clever redirects and smarter routing based on parameters being passed and things like that. Yeah, that's true. Like 301 redirects and things, yeah. um, which you can do at the CDN level, um, but it would be a little bit of custom code outside of the framework usually. Yeah, and like is deploying that separate from how you deploy the app. And, you know, there's, there's, there's services like Netify that make it a lot easier. You have like a TOML file where you can define redirects and things like that. I think getting tied into a platform is good 
yeah. because they know how it works. And yeah, and yeah. I, I do, obviously I'm all in on AWS, but it sometimes feels like you're trying to cobble lots of different services together, whereas a, a Netlify mm. has got a nice, it's a nice developer experience because they've thought about all this yeah. and they want the routing to be as simple as possible. And that's and it's the right level of abstraction, right? Yeah. Because ultimately a lot, a lot of these services are there to really optimize developer happiness and speed to releasing stuff. And ultimately, if that gives you a competitive edge in what you're building, I believe it's fully worth getting in bed with a particular service or whatever. And I think it's a worthwhile trade-off. Yeah. 100% like your Vercel or so exactly. whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I think I think uh, it's worth noting you can do more clever routing with these frameworks like Astro and Next and stuff. But then again, you're relying on that hybrid rendering. You're relying on that that combination of statically generated pages, but then also service side rendered functions and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I, I guess the other thing you mentioned earlier, which is worth noting, is the environmental impact of SSGs. I think they're in general a lot uh, a lot lighter than you know framework deployments. Um, the footprint of a static site is much short, smaller than a yeah than a, yeah a definitely big. you're not generating the page each time yeah. um, you're generally not shipping a bunch of React yeah because you've server side rendered it um, and it's just hopefully yeah. mostly HTML and a little sprinkle of JS in there yeah exactly um, but you know it's um, yeah I, I think um, the only other thing we haven't really touched on is testing um, but I think to be honest that we, we've got we've come such a long way with uh, with testing frameworks that actually you can swap most frameworks in for um, one another now you know there's there's uh, recently you've got Cypress you've got Playwright you've got um, yeah. so there is you know, we've come a long way from just having Selenium as a choice right Playwright's way better than the others <laughs> I, <laughs> in my opinion I've, but, yeah. it. I've, I've only just started playing with it recently because I've had a good a good reason to and uh, I think it's wonderful um, yeah. it's, it, a lot of these frameworks are much better suited to uh, more asynchronous application. They've solved the flakiness, yeah. so it'll wait for a request before it asserts a thing, and yeah. like it's got <laughs> all that in there. So it's not like sleep for five seconds. Yeah, and or, pray. or just long polling a page for something. Yeah, yeah it's it's a lot. Selenium felt like we we're trying to gaffer tape some angry animals together. <laughs> yeah, it did the man. And you're like, oh, the, the, the problem is it got to a point where you're like, you just don't trust the tests anymore. Yeah, that's it. That's well, the point. I do remember a Selenium test suite where we just went, fuck it, we'll run it in twice. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every test twice. If, yeah. it, for, if it passes one of the times, that'll <laughs> yeah. do. We, we've all been there, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, the, the tests have failed. Just give it Just give it another go. <laughs> yeah, and then we write the, someone writes the script. I say <laughs> yeah. someone, it was me. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm an embassy, he's not so good. <laughs> I, I knew this one person once, it was me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's uh, that's that's the end of my love letter to, to Astro. <laughs> well, I'll um, I'll go and build my site in Astro. I don't have a personal website at the moment. Well, you need one. I don't know what you're waiting for. So um, what would I put on it? Um, I guess kind of written down versions of what we're doing right now. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> Um, but no, it's worth worth a look. I strongly encourage you to look at Astro amongst other uh, SSG frameworks because um, they really are just a really wonderful place to uh, to build things like personal websites. Uh, I, I, you know, in Astro, there's a really nice um, kind of feature, which isn't Astro specific, I don't believe, but it's MDX, uh, which is markdown files that you can execute JavaScript code in, you can export variables from. Yeah, I like that. Really powerful hybrid approaches to richer applications that you can build as well as just having a really nice environment to write markdown you know articles and things like that so awesome worth a look um but yeah thanks for listening to my love letter to astra yeah it was great <laughs> and uh, yeah thanks for letting me know about all the new newness that's going on in the ssg world it's been a pleasure thanks for listening to our episode on static site generators hit subscribe and share with your friends. Thank you.